Welcome, welcome, welcome. I am so very glad you're here, whether you're joining us in person or online. My name is Seth. This is The Foundry, where we are all about a better you and a better world. Welcome to our family gathering. I found my coffee cup I was missing. It was right there the whole time. That's why there's two. So, we are in week two of our series called Wake Up, O oh Sleeper. Last week, we talked about this idea that when it comes to this Advent, this season of waiting, that maybe since the thing that we're waiting for, that is the birth of the Savior, has already come, then maybe the waiting isn't actually being done by us. Like, we're not waiting on God to send the Savior, but maybe rather God is waiting on us to wake up to the presence of Christ that is already here that we are surrounded by. We also talked about this idea of hope and how because hope was fulfilled by the Savior, because that was fulfilled at the birth of Christ, that maybe hope also isn't something that we are waiting for, but rather maybe hope is the thing that we are now currently becoming or at least should become. So this week we move on. We want to try to continue to wake up to the beauty and the significance of the incarnation. And, and there's a phrase that we used last week that, that I love, one of, my favorite, one of my favorite phrases. We said that there's nowhere that God isn't. Right? I love this idea. I, lo- I love to think about this, that we are saturated in the presence of God, that there's this everywhereness of God that we cannot be separated from. But here's the problem maybe with that way of thinking. And the problem is that this is something that we may, may be able to sense and see and feel and experience in the good things, when things go our way in this life. But this is something that might be much harder to see and experience and to sense and to feel like when things are not so good, when things don't go our way. This is much harder to do to understand the everywhereness of God like when you're watching the nightly news, isn't it? It's easy to sense the presence of God when you're watching a beautiful sunrise or a sunset or you've witnessed the birth of a newborn baby or something like that. It's much more difficult to to sense the presence of God when you see the violence and bloodshed and warfare and the abuse and the, the neglect and the hatred that seems to be a part of our world, the world that we live in. So the other day, uh... I took my daughter to softball practice. My wife was at work, which means I had to also take the boys because, you know, I'm their dad. So we all go to softball practice, and I get my my chair out, and I set my chair down, and I get my book out because that's what I like to do. I'm like, if if I'm going to be here, like, I'll make it productive, I guess. Like, so I'm going to do some reading. And so I can, I'm sitting here, I'm watching the softball practice take place over here, and then my two boys, they run over to this little patch of grass on the side, and they start to play football. They're playing one-on-one football, which is funny. Like an eight-year-old and a six-year-old playing one-on-one football. So anyways, they're doing that, and they're, they're just like laughing, and they're giggling, they're tackling, they're getting hurt, and then they're taking care of each other, then they're laughing and tackling again. It's this whole process. So it's a beautiful night. We're hanging out and just enjoying this. I'm reading, watching, watching. And uh, about an hour into this, like, apparently 17-hour-long uh, practice, which is what it feels like, um, I kind of look over to where the boys are, just checking, you know, keep an eye on them. And I look over, and the two boys are, like, side by side, on the ground, on their hands and knees, and they've got each other in headlocks. And they're just kind of like this, and they're just like laughing and giggling with their faces, and they weren't even in the, in the grass at this point, they were like in the clay, like in the clay that was like for the pitchers to warm up on. And so I'm like, <laughs> what are they doing? And so I'm just like, I just watch. I just watch these two kids that like, have literally wore themselves out playing and tackling each other, and now are on the ground together, have each other in headlocks, but yet they both refuse to let go of each other, so they're just staring at each other and laughing with their faces in the dirt. I just watched because it was this like, really, it was just two dudes, two brothers being dudes. Like they were in a field by themselves. There was nobody else around, just them, and they're having this incredible time. And and so in that moment, as I watched, like it became this 
kind of transcendent moment. It became this rapture, rapturous moment. Like, it was like time stood still. It was this eternity, and it was this beautiful fullness to the whole thing. It was like in that moment, it became like very almost like spiritual. It became this pure and holy moment where we were caught up together in the presence of the everywhereness of God. I experienced the fullness of life in that moment. It's easy to experience the presence of God in stuff like that. Not too long ago, we were at uh, we were in Ormond Beach. Our family went like a little weekend trip or something. Stayed at a hotel. We spent the day playing on the beach. That night, we went to get some dinner with the family, and so we went to this little tiki hut restaurant thing, having a great evening. And, and it was just one of those moments where it was like, "This is great." Like it was I don't know spring break or something. I, I don't remember. But we're sitting there. I'm thinking, "This is pretty awesome." We get to. Like, how blessed we are. We get to have this time. We can afford to take our family out to dinner. Like, this is wonderful. And so we're sitting there having this beautiful moment. And in the middle of that, there's like these TVs all around the restaurant. And the news came on. And it was like just after the Russian invasion of the Ukraine. And they start showing like all the bad, all the things that are wrong, all the mess of the world. And so here I am experiencing this beautiful moment, but in that moment, I'm also confronted with the ugliness of the world. And so it created this like, interesting discord within my being because like, I could see God here in front of me, but where was God in all of that? Where was God in all of that? Where's God in the nightly news? This is like the big question, right? And I don't know that we have like a super clear, maybe cognitively sufficient answer for this sort of thing. People have been wrestling for, for, for thousands of years with this question. But what I do know is that the birth of Jesus and the context surrounding his birth, it all very much points to this idea that God reveals God's self in the places that we do not expect to see or find God. God reveals God's self in the place that we might even consider to be like the absence of God. God reveals God's self in what we might consider to be all the wrong places. You see, and if we can begin to understand this, like if we can really like wrap our brains around this and like our understanding, like. I think this actually should help to give us a new perspective on like life. So I want to look at the birth story of Jesus according to the Gospel of Matthew. Um, so Matthew chapter one, and, and I want to look at want to look at how this whole thing got started. Before we get into that, what we have to remember is the larger like context of this historical narrative that this birth story is taking place in. Okay, you have, you have Israel, you have God's chosen people that have been given this promise like that's been handed down from generation to generation. And the promise is you will be your own people and you will have your own land. And yet, they are currently in the, in the position of being occupied by the Roman, Roman Empire. They're underneath this Roman oppression. This is a dark time for Israel. The people are losing their jobs. They're losing their family lands. There's this like believed to be 80 to 90% taxation rate. They're struggling to feed their families. This is a dark time. This, like, if there was a nightly news for, like, the story of Jesus, like, and we could watch it that way, I think watching it would feel a lot like what we feel as we've been following stories like the Ukrainian invasion. The Roman Empire has invaded a tiny country of Israel. They have marched in with extreme military force, and they have trampled anyone who stood in their way. We just got word that they've displaced uh, the local government, and now they're installing their own leaders to ensure peace through force, making sure that the heavy Roman taxation will be carried out amongst the people. Like, if you were watching this story in real time, this would be something that you'd, like, reach out to your friends and be like, yo, are you watching? Are you seeing what's happening in Israel? Like, do you see, like, this country is just taking over this other country, and do you see what they're doing to the people? Like, you would, this would, like, stand out. This is the context of the birth of Jesus. This is the nightly news story. And not only that, but even within this context of the nightly news story that is the birth of Jesus, like the whole Joseph, Mary, virgin birth thing, from an outside perspective, from a cultural perspective, it's a huge mess of a situation. 
Okay, look at this, Matthew chapter one, verse 18. This is how the birth of the Messiah came about. His mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph, but before they came together, she, found, she was found to be pregnant through the Holy Spirit. Because Joseph, her husband, was faithful to the law and yet did not want to expose her to public disgrace, he had in mind to divorce her quietly. Okay, now, so let's pause there. You've got this cute young couple. They're super in love. It's really sweet. They've, they've taken engagement photos. They've sent out Save the Date. They've picked the color scheme for their wedding. They're really excited. But then just before they book the caterer, Mary finds out she's pregnant, and she goes, God did it. <laughs> like, this might be a difficult pill for Joseph to swallow. Do you know what I'm saying? Like, in, in this time, in this culture, like, this is a huge ordeal. This is like a big no, no. This is like against the wishes of God. Like, I actually went down some, like, crazy deep rabbit holes this week on marriage law and custom and all this stuff concerning uh, the, this situation, and <laughs> we don't have time for all of it. But... Basically, when he finds out that his virgin wife is pregnant, according to the law, he has a responsibility to do something about it. And the thing that uh, he has the responsibility to do will not work out well for Mary. It says Joseph was faithful to the law. Well, what does the law say? Because he has no idea at this time yet. We don't know the story. If we don't know the story, he, he has no idea whether what she says is true or not. According to the law, what does the law say should happen in a particular situation like this? Well, let's take a look. Leviticus chapter 20, verse 10. If a man commits adultery with another man's wife, with the wife of his neighbor, both the adulterer and the adulteress are to be put to death. At least there's like equality within it. Uh, Deuteronomy 22. If a man is found sleeping with another man's wife, both the man who slept with her and the woman must die. You must purge the evil from Israel. So Joseph was a man faithful to the law. But yet, it says, he didn't want to expose her to this public disgrace, you know, like, and death. So even though he had no way of knowing it at this point, whether what she said is true, he essentially is disobeying God's law by not outing her he begins to contemplate this alternative way to handle the situation. So even though the law clearly states what he should do, he kind of skirts the law to protect the dignity and the life of this woman. Which kind of makes you wonder, like, how is it that so many Christians uh, have become so legalistic in their understanding of God and God's word? Doesn't it? Like, the story of Jesus, which is what Christianity is based on, starts with the earthly father of the Messiah, not necessarily following the rules. <laughs> it's almost like we read the story of Christmas every year and we miss the thing that's right in front of us. The story continues, Matthew chapter uh, 1, verse 20. But after he had considered this, see, he didn't know yet, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son and you are to give him the name Jesus because he will save his people from their sins. Man, it's a good thing he didn't carry out the letter of the law, huh? Good thing he didn't just do what the good book says. Well, God said it, I believe it, that settles it. Well, Joseph didn't. <laughs> this is Jesus' father. Oh. So here you have the potential for this pretty big scandal in this tiny village, in the remote part of this massive Roman Empire. And then, even after the baby is born, because Herod is out for blood, Herod is looking to kill this newly crowned king of the Jews, they end up on the run. Jo uh, Angel comes to Joseph and tells him, hey, take your family, flee from this area, don't come back for a while. Which means now you have this, these two people and their baby who have now been displaced. They are homeless. They are on the run from their government. And they themselves become foreigners and immigrants in a different land. Think about how like, insane the story is when you put the whole thing together. And imagine that we could view this story objectively, that we didn't have the insight of the Gospel of Matthew. If you didn't know the story already, 
the world's largest military superpower at the time, invades and oppresses this small, fairly defenseless, defenseless country. Oh man, things are bad. The world is really going to hell in a handbasket. We're under attack. I don't know what's happening. The world is falling apart. Where is God in this? Then you have Joseph, like, skirting the law, disobeying God's commands to defend his pregnant girlfriend, who we are not sure yet who the father is. Oh, man, things are bad. Nobody's respecting religion anymore. People are just doing what they want. Things are falling apart. What's wrong with our country? That's probably, probably why we got invaded, because we turned our backs on God. Then the family is displaced. They're displaced for fear of having their own son murdered by the government. Oh, man, things are bad. The world is messed up. People are scattering. Who's going to take in the immigrants? Hope they don't come here. Like, if you're looking at this story objectively and you don't know the whole story, the obvious question, at least to me, would be like, where's God in all of that? How could God even be in this situation? It's so terrible. It's falling apart. And yet, God is there. God is there in the middle of the mess, in the middle of the hurt, the middle of the chaos, the suffering, the turmoil. And here's the thing, even when God reveals God's self, how does God do it? In the most unlikely of ways, as this vulnerable, completely dependent, drooling baby this infant that can't take care of itself. God did not reveal God's self to humanity in power, in strength, in majesty, in royalty, in the upper middle class where everything is nice and clean and orderly and fair. God revealed God's self in the most unlikely of ways, in the most unlikely of places. God reveals God's self in the place that most of us would never expect to find God. Which kind of makes you wonder, have we been looking for God in the wrong places? It also makes me wonder like, if our understanding of God might be a bit limited because we're looking for God in, in like, the nice places, not in the places where we assume that the presence of God is absent, in the mess. Which kind of makes me think, it's, it's almost like, if we really believe in this idea of the Savior and the Messiah, that God has come among us to rescue us and redeem us, to redeem humanity and all of creation, if we really believe that, then doesn't the mess actually seem like the most logical place for Christ to come into the world? Like the most unsuspecting places are exactly where we should expect to find Christ the most. All right, now let's take this like a step further. Let's get just a, just a little bit more crazy just for fun if you're up for it. Uh, let's back up. Let's back up before like the mess of this birth story. Let's look at the history and the lineage of, of, of the line of Jesus that leads up to this because I think even this is quite telling, okay? Matthew begins his gospel with the lineage of Jesus going all the way back to Abraham. <sighs> Here we go. This is the genealogy of Jesus, the Messiah, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Here we go. Abraham was the father of Isaac, Isaac the father of Jacob, Jacob the father of Judah and his brothers, Judah the father of Perez and Zerah, whose mother was Tamar, Perez the father of Hezron, Hezron the father of Ram, Ram the father of Amminadab, Amminadab the father of Nashon, Nashon the father of Salmon, Salmon the father of Boaz, whose mother was Rahab, Boaz the father of Obed, whose mother was Ruth, Obed the father of Jesse, Jesse the father of King David, David was the father of King Solomon, whose mother had been Uriah's wife. <laughs> This goes on for 10 more verses, <laughs> which I'm not going to do because I didn't practice. And then it kind of concludes in verse 16 with this. And Jacob, the father of Joseph, the husband of Mary, Mary was the mother of Jesus, who was called, who was called the Messiah. OK, so we don't have time to go through all the names on the whole 16 verses, obviously. Uh, and even a couple years ago, we did like the women of the lineage of Jesus. There was like five women, which the fact that the women are included in the genealogy in the Gospel of Matthew was a huge deal because this is a very patriarchal society. So women had really no rights. So the fact that they are in there speaks to a new way of operating to begin with. Okay, so 
let's look at the distinguished and royal lineage of the Messiah. Okay, so let's go with this. Can we, can we bring that? Can we just leave that scripture up behind me? Can we, can we do that, that last one? No, 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 the, the previous one, the genealogy. Okay, so, okay, go back one more. Okay, that starts with Abraham. Abraham, the father of Isaac. We know this, we understand this. Let's think about who Abraham was. We know that Abraham lied twice about his wife being his sister in order to preserve his own life. We also know that he slept with his wife's maidservant with her permission in order to have a child because they couldn't have a child. Even though God would, said that he would give them a child, they took matters into their own hands. They had a son named Ishmael, who's not on this list, who would have been the firstborn son of Abraham by the maidservant Hagar, but Abraham sent him away. Sarah eventually gets pregnant, and she has Isaac. So Isaac, uh, Isaac is the second son of Abraham, which is a weird thing because the lineage that you're normally tracking goes through the oldest born, and yet Isaac is the second son. So Isaac grows up. His, his life is pre seemingly pretty quiet, um, but he is the father of Jacob and Esau. Jacob, who carry out, carries on the lineage of Jesus, uh, his name actually means deceiver. He is the one who tricks and deceives his father and his brother with the help of his mother into receiving the, the inheritance of the firstborn, even though, like Isaac, he is also the secondborn. So the story already is not how things should go. This lineage continues through Jacob, who has 12 sons, of which the lineage of Jesus runs through Judah. Judah seems to be okay, except for the fact that he was the one that talked his brothers into selling his brother Joseph into slavery. You might think, though, you could make the case that it was actually an act of mercy because the brothers actually wanted to kill him, and, and Judah said, no, 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 maybe let, like he's our brother. Maybe we shouldn't kill him. Maybe we'll just sell him into slavery. So Judah grows up. Um, he, he ends up marrying outside the tribe. He marries a Canaanite woman, which is entirely against God's wishes. He has three sons. The oldest one's name is Ur. He gets a wife for Ur named Tamar. Ur, apparently, is so evil and vile that God just kills him. Then, according to custom and law, Tamar, the, son of the, uh, the wife of the oldest son, gets passed down to Onan, the second son. But Onan refused to give her a baby because he didn't want to like, mess with the inheritance and the lines of all this stuff. He refuses to put a baby in her, so God kills him for doing that. Then Judah has a third son, his youngest son, and he says, hey, I'll, 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 give, you to, I'll give Tamar to you, or I'll give you to Tamar, whatever. And uh, he makes this promise, but then he goes back on it. He breaks that promise. So then now you have Tamar, who is this twice-widowed woman with no kids of her own, basically with nobody to, to fend for her. So she then pretends to be a prostitute whom Judah sleeps with and gets pregnant. So now she has been impregnated by her father-in-law, and the baby is Perez, who is which the lineage of Jesus now runs. Then you have Hezron, who's been appointed to be uh, by God to be the prince over the tribe of Judah. He seems to be okay, but he does have five different kids from a couple different women. Then you have Ram, not much written about Ram. Then you have Aminadab, who became the father-in-law father of the high priest Aaron, who seems to be a decent dude and was believed to be one of the Levites that helped to carry the Ark of the Covenant home from the Philistines back to Jerusalem. That was a big deal. After that, you have Nashon. Uh, Nashon. Nashon, he seems to be a pretty good dude. He's a military leader with noble character. Then you have Salmon. Salmon, who who it says uh, was the father of Boaz who married Rahab. Rahab, uh, who was a foreigner, who was a Canaanite, who was an outside woman, who uh, was either believed to be a madam, like a, like a madam of a brothel, or a prostitute herself, which of course begs the question, hey, how did you guys meet? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> then you have Obed... And Jesse, and then David. David, who was a man after God's own heart, but who committed adultery and then developed a plot and carried out the plan to get rid of his adulteress, his husband, and then who also killed a whole lot of people during his fighting days. And this is only part of the ancestry of Jesus. So, like, if you came away from your Thanksgiving Day gathering and thought, like, man, my family's a mess. <laughs> <laughs> like, if you came to Jesus with, like, your family woes, Jesus would be like, don't get me started. Don't, don't even get me started. 
right? So you look at this list, and yeah, there's some decent people on there, but there's also a whole lot of mess. This is like soap opera level of chaos and dysfunction, the lying, the cheating, the sleeping around, the bringing foreigners into the family, foreign women, women of the night, the murder, the betrayal. This is a docu-series waiting to happen, and we would all watch it. <laughs> Even if we didn't tell each other. This is a family ancestry that you'd be like, yeah, I'm not sure about those guys. Like, what a mess. What a mess. And yet this is the line of people that brings forth the Savior of the world. Through all this mess, through all these weaknesses, through all these failures, Christ is birthed into the world. It's almost like this whole thing is pointing us to this idea that maybe God is not where we think God will be. Or maybe it's like we're looking in the wrong places. And maybe the point is that the very places that we least suspect for God to be present is exactly where the Christ will be birthed. So the, second, uh, the theme for the second week of Advent is peace. Maybe the question is like, what's this have to do with peace at all? Well, I can tell you, as I was putting this stuff together this week, it, it kind of occurred to me, like, this whole thing, all of this should actually give us a great deal of peace. The reality that God gifted God's self to humanity to redeem and restore all things, that should bring peace. This idea of the everywhereness of God, that there's nowhere that God isn't, that should bring peace. The fact that Jesus was given the name Emmanuel, which means God with us. So if God is everywhere and God is always with us, then it means we are never alone and we never have to do anything by ourselves. Like no matter what you're going through is there, that should bring peace. The idea that Jesus, who was God incarnate, who was given the name Emmanuel, was also given the title of the Prince of Peace. And the Prince of Peace says things, and like in Matthew chapter 11 where he says this, Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and I am humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. That should give us peace. This is an invitation to unburden yourself. He's literally giving you a way to find peace. Stop carrying all the things. And even the stuff today, this idea that everything we've looked through, that when life seems to be falling apart, when there doesn't seem to be light at the end of the tunnel, when you're overwhelmed with everything that's wrong in your life or in the world, this may be the very fact, the, the very place that the Christ will be born into your world. That should bring peace. You know, maybe, maybe we need to rethink like how we contemplate and how we understand strife and turmoil and conflict in our lives. Maybe, maybe your life isn't falling apart. Maybe your life is simply pregnant with the divine waiting to come forth into your reality. Maybe you're experiencing what you're experiencing through that difficulty are the labor pains that precede new life. That should give us peace, no matter what we're going through. That should give us peace. Or even when we look at this crazy backstory and history of the family and the lineage of Jesus, this lineage that is the line of the Savior, and we see this list of so many people who have failed, so many people who have issues, so many people that made bad decisions, that disobeyed or outright turned their backs on God, and yet this is still the place that Christ entered the world. That should give us peace, because if Christ can come into the world through them, like, what are we really worried about? Like, you're okay. You are loved. You belong. And you may spend a lot of time thinking about all of your various flaws and all of your shortcomings and all of your mistakes and all of your regrets and you may carry some guilt or shame and you may continually be comparing yourself to others and making a long list of all the ways you don't measure up. And maybe when you look at yourself, all you see is all the things that are wrong with you and you continually live in this mindset of never feeling like you're enough. Is it possible that all these things that you point to as weaknesses 
may in fact be the very fertile place into which the incarnation can be conceived. Plus, I mean, if you want to play the comparison game, not that you should, you shouldn't do that, it's a bad idea, be you, but just for fun, like, if we did compare ourselves to the family of Jesus, let's just try this and see if this makes you feel better, okay? Um, Have you ever lied uh, to anyone about your spouse being your sibling in order to preserve your life? No? Okay. Okay. Um, Have have you ever, like... um, (laughs) Have you ever slept with your wife's maid servant in order to produce an heir only then to later disown your heir? No, no, okay, okay. Have you ever conspired with your mom and your brother to get the family inheritance, well, conspired with your mom to trick your, your brother and your dad into getting the family inheritance and then had to flee to a different country? No, okay. Um, have you ever tried to sell one of your siblings to a foreign slave trader? You got you, Maybe you've thought about it. Have you ever tried to sell a sibling to a foreign slave trader because you were jealous of your parents' love for your sibling? Oh, don't answer that. that one. Some of these are rhetorical. <laughs> okay. Uh, Have you ever went to visit a prostitute and accidentally slept with your (laughs) daughter-in-law? Is is your father also your grandfather? (laughs) You might be a redneck if... (laughs) Like, you're okay. (laughs) You're okay. Knowing that this group of messed up people is the group that God chose to enter the world through should give us a great deal of peace. So maybe what the Christmas story reveals to us today, what it's inviting us to wake up to, or the reality that currently exists that we need to wake up to, is that maybe peace isn't something that we can only experience when there is a lack of problems and chaos. And that maybe the presence of problems and conflict Do not negate or prohibit peace. When we wake up to the idea of the everywhereness of God, it allows us to understand that there is nowhere that God isn't. That God is both in the places that we expect and God is in the places that we are the least likely to expect. God is both in the brothers who have locked each other in a headlock on the ground, laughing and smiling and having the time of their lives. And even though we may struggle to see it, God will be in the turmoil in the Ukraine. Even though it may be hidden, even though we may struggle to understand it, even though it might not make any sense to us at all, hidden somewhere in the mess will be the very birthplace of Christ. And you may say, well, that's a crazy idea. I don't see it. I don't get it. I don't see it. I don't get it. I'm really, yeah. But that's no less crazy of an idea than God becoming human and being born to a nobody teenage girl in the first century in the remote part of a small country during a time of great oppression into a family of misfits. If the Prince of Peace can enter into the world and triumph, triumph, through these types of people and in that type of mess. I think we should take great comfort in the idea that Christ can enter into the world and triumph through us kind of people in our kind of mess. You see, and when we understand this, when this like really sets in, It should help us to realize that no matter how bad we mess up, no matter how many mistakes we make, no matter how dark the world may seem, no matter how upside down we may feel, those places of fear, those places of shame, those places of darkness, those may in fact be the very birthplace of Christ. And that, my friends, should give us a great deal of peace.
of communion, we're going to also reflect on the Advent season, reflect on what it means for Emmanuel, for God to be with us. There will be stations set up around the room for you to have communion. There will be people next to the cross and the prayer wall if you want someone to pray with. If you're joining us online, join in this moment with us with anything that you, any of the food or drinks that you have at your house. And if you need prayer, you can type in the chat and there's someone there to pray with you as well. Last week for Advent, we focused on hope. This idea of waking up to God in our midst, that God is already here and now and our hope is realized. We get to live it out. And this week, as Seth said, is peace. Recognizing the divine that is in humanity, that God is with us that we don't have to come to a place of perfection or perfect calm and quiet in our lives to find God, that in the midst of our struggles and turmoils, in the worst and most difficult parts of our lives, God is here with us. God meets us there always. If you've been here for a bit, or we, we use the word teleos to describe this completeness, this fullness that God is desiring for us. But we don't have to reach that completeness to find God. It is not a path to God, because God is with us now. It is God that helps move us along to a deeper, a fuller, a better life. A better world and a better us starts with recognizing God among us, God in our lives, every day. If you will pray with me as we enter deeper into this time of communion. Lord, thank you. Thank you for being here with us in the struggles, in the hurts, where where it feels like we're alone, that it feels like no one understands us or what we're going through. You are there, and you know us. When When we don't know where to go in our lives, when we don't know what to do, when the lights are shut out around us, Lord, you are there with us, next to us. Lord, help us to recognize you. Help us to not just know that you're here, but to feel that you are with us. We pray this in the name of your Son, Emmanuel, and in the power of your Spirit that lives in us. Amen.